Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Hallelujah. Why not lift your hands to him this morning? Give him praise and glory. Give him praise. Bless his name. Bless his name. Oh, bless his name. Say something to him. Thank you, Father. Glory to your name. We bless you. We ascribe all the praise and the honor to your name. Lift your hands, church. Lift your hands, church. Bless him. Bless him. Play, bla praise his name. Praise his name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You are good and your mercies endure forever. Oh, we bless your name. Oh, we give you praise. We give you praise and we give you glory. We give you praise and we give you glory. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. All right, let's turn in our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 16 to 19 and 24 to 33. Deuteronomy chapter 2. We started a message last week, which we dubbed coming into your prepared place. How many of you are here? Coming into your prepared place. Our text, Deuteronomy 2, beginning in verse 16 to 19, and then 24 to 33. It says, So it was when all the men of the war had finally perished from among the people that the Lord spoke to me. This is Moses. This day you are to cross over at Ar, the boundary of Moab. And when you come near to the people of Amnon, Ammon, do not harass them or meddle with them for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession because I have given it to the descendants of Lot as a possession. Rise, take your journey and cross over the Ar River Anon. Look, I have given into your hand Sihon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you and i sent messengers from the wilderness of kedimoth to sihon king of heshbon with words of peace saying let me pass through your land and i will keep strictly to the road and i will not turn neither to the right nor to the left you shall sell me food for money that i may eat and give me water for money that I may drink, only let me pass through on foot, just as the descendants of Esau, who dwelt in Seir, and the Moabites, who dwelt in Ar, did for me, until I crossed the Jordan to the land of the, uh, which the Lord our God is given. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass through, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate, that he might deliver him into your hand as it is this day. And the Lord said to me, See, I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to possess it that you may inherit his land. Then Sihon and all his people came out to fight us at Jehaz. And the Lord our God delivered him over to us. So we defeated him, his sons and his people. Amen. So we're looking at this text and this uh, incident of Israel moving into some part of the land of promise. When God met up with Moses in Exodus chapter 3, he promised to give them what we know today as the promised land. Part of that promised land included the land of the Amorites. Say Amorites. You would observe in our text that the king uh, Sihon was the king of Heshbon, and Heshbon was part of the Amorite territory. All right. And when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, one of the first places they were to go into at the border of Kadesh Barnea, you find this in Numbers chapter 3, was Amorite territory. But we all know that they failed in that endeavor. So they circled, they circled the entire land. Uh, they wandered in the wilderness, I should say, for 40 years. And then before you find this in Numbers 21, they now came to another border of Amorite territory, which is the land of King uh, of Heshbon, uh, the, 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 the King Sihon. And so this was an example of Israel moving into part of their prepared place. 
just as we today have a prepared place allocated to us through the word of God. Again, let me take the liberty to read part of the prophecy that was given to us during Hallelujah Week. This is day three. God said through pastor, there is a prepared place just for you, says the Spirit of God. This prepared place has been empty. It's been desolate. It ought not to be so. This prepared place has been occupied by strangers. It ought not to be so. The flow will evict them. The flow will evict them. The flow will move them. They do not belong there, for it was not prepared for them. I prepared it for you, and now it's time to do what? To move. It's time to occupy what has been prepared for you. It's a good place. It's a better place. It's a covenant place. It is my prepared place. Can you say a good amen? So we're using this text to glean a few thoughts that will better position us to move into our prepared place. So we started this last week and we looked at one point. There are three things we want to look at. I hope we'll get through the three of them. But the first one we said last week is know what the Lord has given. Do you remember that? And under that, we said that what the Lord or what God has given you is good. You can rest assured on that, that what God has made available to you in this prepared place is good. Then number two, we said recognize the different ways through which God gives. He gives specifically and he gives generally. He gives, he give, yes, he gives generally by promise and he gives specifically by, by what? Purpose. So you need to know what, is, what has God allotted to you. One of the best things you can do for yourself this season is to take out time to pray a lot and find out, say, Lord, this word you gave me, that this season is uh, my season of the well flow, and that there is a prepared place for me. Lord, what exactly is my prepared place? What exactly is my allotment? There's a verse I didn't use last week. It was in my notes, but I didn't get through all I had to teach last week. Psalm 16, verse 5. It says, uh, uh, it says, The lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a goodly heritage. So God has an allotment for you. And you don't need to be afraid. Is my allotment good? Oh, what is going to come my way? Is it good or is it not good? No, you don't need to be, you don't need to think about that because wherever your allotment falls, wherever the lines fall onto you, they are pleasant places. And in that place, you have a goodly heritage. Can you say good amen? So our second point is what we want to look at today. Look again into our text. Chapter 2, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 24. This is our main text, verse 24 and 31, our main text in this study. Verse 21 says, rise, take your journey and cross over the river Anon. Look, I have given into your hand Sihon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land begin to possess it and engage him in battle. I want you to see the first phrase in that verse. Rise, take your journey and cross over the river Anon. That phrase not only speaks of motion and action. Remember our message is coming into what? Your prepared place. Coming or moving into your prepared place. Can you say amen? So notice that phrase speaks of motion, movement or action. But more than that, look at what it says. Rise. Who realizes that is action? Who agrees that is motion? Not only did he say rise, he says take your journey. That is movement, eh? But more than that, he now says do what? Do what? Cross over the river. If there is a bridge, climb over the bridge. If there is no bridge, what do you do? Cross over. That means go through the water. Whatever it is you need to do, you must cross over. So the first thing he says, rise. Is that what he says? Yes, take your journey, cross over. Those phrases all refer to motion, but listen, not just motion or movement, but movement in the right direction. Movement where? In the right direction. So our second point is move in the right direction. To come into your prepared place, move, yes, 
move, right? But it's not just moving because you could move in the wrong direction. But God specified, he told them the place they are to move through. Move through, what did he say? Cross over the river and on. That was, speci that was specific. Can you say a good amen? So as you are moving and motioning into your pro prepared place, it is imperative that you move in the right direction. You know, God is always pointing us in the right direction in our lives. Look at Psalm 32 verse 8. It says, I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Look at that. He didn't, say, he didn't just say, I will instruct you and teach you. He says, in the way, not just in the way, but in the way that you should go. So there is a way I should go. There is a place prepared for me. There is a place prepared for you. Can you say amen? And then the instruction of God will detail to you the way you should go. And not only that, he then says, I will counsel you with my eye upon you. That is, you will never leave my focus. You will never be out of my view. You will, be ne you will never be away from my spotlight. And as long as my spotlight is upon you, per minute, per second, every intersection, every step of the way, I will tell you where to go to and where not to go to. The prophet Isaiah said that even though the Lord feeds you with the bread of affliction and all these things. He said, your teachers will never re be removed from you, but your ears will hear a word behind you telling you, this is the way, this is the way. Turn to the right and turn to the left. Can you say amen? So God is committed to bringing you into that place and he expects you to move, but he's guiding you every blessed step of the way. So some things under our main points today. Write this down. Firstly, moving in the right direction helps you take possession of what is yours. Moving in the right direction helps you take possession of what is yours. Perhaps it may, you may even say it is one of the primary ways of taking possession of what is yours. Think with me for a moment. God told the children of Israel, rise, take your journey, cross the river, what would have happened if the children of Israel sat behind and they refused to move? God said that that land that they were meant to go and possess, verse 24, it says, look, I have given into your hand Sihon, the Amorite, the king of Heshbon, and his land. I have given it to you. So who, who, who owned that land? Who owned the land? The Amorites or the children of Israel? Sorry? The children of Israel. But when you hear, but God still said, uh, what's his name? Uh, Sihon and his land. So whose, whose is it? God said, I have given it to you. If you remember the prophecy God gave us through Pastor, I think that same day she gave us that word of the prepared place. She said that the land was not for them, but other occupants have been there. So it means there could be something that belongs to you right now, but you don't know it. Or somebody else is in possession. At this moment, there could be part ownership of a company that is yours today. You didn't hear me. <clears throat> oh my God. You could be part owner of something that today you are not aware of. For one, you are not omniscient. You don't know everything. But when God even tells you that, okay, move in this direction, if you give, you can convince yourself and convince others why you will not move. As long as you don't move, what is actually yours will not come to you. So we have a distinction here, listen, between possession and ownership. Possession and ownership. Somebody can be in possession of something, but they don't own it. By the same token, somebody can own it, but they are not in possession. Some of you here, a good number of you here are landlords. You have houses, you have buildings you have built, and you have let those buildings out, those premises out. That land, that, those premises, though you are the owner, you are not in possession. But possession is very important. 
Because legally, you may have heard the phrase, possession is nine-tenths of the law. That is, it is easy to establish ownership based on what? Possession. There are people who are trespassers. They have been in la on a property for 50 years. Nobody has challenged them. Nobody has asked them. After a while, they will begin to wax bold and begin to claim ownership. But it's not theirs. It is not theirs. They have been in that place for so long. So if God has given you something and he's prompting you now and telling you to move, then he's telling you to move because it's, it's, it's yours. Or at least in this season, it is yours. You see, the children of Israel did not move into the promised land immediately. One of the reasons was God was preparing it for them. You see, these Amorites, these Canaanites, they were there building those walls that God, those houses, those walls that God would say, houses you did not build. That's what they were doing. When God told Abraham uh, in Genesis chapter 15 of the promised land, he says in the, I forget the generation, in this generation I will bring them into the land of the Amorites because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. That means those Amorites were still living on borrowed time. God is a just God and he will not mete out judgment until the right time. So while they, they were there, but while they were there, what do you think they were doing? They were building those lands for them. They were building those gardens. They were doing all of those things. Then at the right time, God told the children of Israel, now it is time. The land is now fully prepared for you. That is why somebody will label and build up a company and then for some reason the person will be, in a, will be in between a rock and a hard place and will sell that company for 50%. And the person who will be ready to buy it is you. Or he will want to sell it for 30%. Please, just give me this money. I just need the money. I bet take the company. It is so much based on, on my head. It's based on his head because his time is up. He's still in possession, but you are the owner. So God wants you as the owner to move into what belongs to you so that ownership and possession match. Are you following me? So the land was theirs, but they had not taken possession. So I said, I gave the analogy that possession is nine-tenths of the law. You know, and we can explain this even when it comes to our rights and our privileges in Christ as positional and experiential. Positional is what you own. Experiential is what you possess. Are you following me? Positionally is that by the stripes of Jesus Christ you are healed. Positionally is that you have the peace of God. But experientially, you see, you can have the peace of God, you can have the joy of God, but you're the most sad person. You own, you own peace, right? You own joy. It's in your spirit. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. But experientially, daily in life, you're not enjoying it. Why will you have joy and all every time people come around you, they become moody? You have so practiced depression that your depression is now demonic. There is a, excuse my language, normal depression. Depression is not normal, but you know what I'm trying to say is that, you know, every now and then, even the best persons have a little bit of mood seesaws, right? But there are people who, they've practiced pity party and depression. That when you come at, around them and say, enjoy any small thing, they are a volcanic eruption waiting to happen. And then it's one of the... Eh? A pig, leave me, leave me, leave me. And then they begin to ventilate and hyperventilate. But they are born again. They have the peace of God. They have the joy of the Lord, but they never practice the joy of God. They, are in, they own it, but they are not actively possessing it. Amen, church? God wants ownership to match with possession. God wants positional to match with experiential. That I really take hold of everything that God has given unto me. Can you say a good amen? Write Deuteronomy 1, 19 to 21 down. Deuteronomy 1, 19 to 21. So we departed from Horeb and went through the great and terrible wilderness which was you saw on the way 
to the mountain of the Amorites as the Lord our God commanded. Then we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I told you, you have come to the mountains of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. What's that next phrase? Two words. Go up and do what? Are you there? Deuteronomy 1, 19 to 21. Verse 21. It says, go up and possess it. So, rising and moving, going up is the first step into claiming or receiving what is yours. So that's number one. Moving in the right direction helps you take possession of what is yours. Number two, behind your movement is God's commitment to bring you into your prepared place. Or you could just say behind your movement is God's commitment. Is God's commitment. Your movement equals what? God's commitment. Moving in the right direction now. Is God's commitment. God is not committed to bring you into a place he has not prepared for you. God's commitment is to bring you into a place he has prepared for you. In fact, it is because he has prepared that place for you that he's committed to moving you into that place. Now look at our text again. Let me show you something. It says, rise and take your journey. Now let's look at Exodus chapter 3 verse 8. So who was to rise? Talk to me. Who was to rise? Israel. Good. Who was to take their journey and cross over? Israel. Rise up. We could also say go. There are different words we can use to explain that. Now look at Exodus 3, 8. This is God's word to Moses about taking the children of Israel out and bringing them in to the promised land. He says, so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Now look at this. And to bring them up from that land to or into a good and large land into a land flowing with milk and honey i want you to observe that god says that he came down to deliver them out of the egyptians and to bring them up you will always find this phrase in the old testament in reference to the children of israel entering the promised land to bring them up to bring them up to bring them up. How, doesn't the Bible say that God has delivered us from the authority of darkness? Doesn't the Bible say that God has raised us, raised us up? He met us in the mock and mire of sin, isn't it? But his grace came to us and he lifted us and he made us, lifted up to the highest place and made us to sit together. Can you say a good amen? But we see here, he says, I have come to bring them up. So he told the children of Israel, rise. Follow me carefully. Rise. But he now said, I am going to bring you up. There is a partnership involved that, involved there. In other words, the understand that the children of Israel could not go into that land if God did not tell them to go there. Or the assurance that they would take the land was based on what God told them. However, God needed them to move for him to bring them in. Did you get that? The children of Israel could not go on their own, yet God could not take them into the land all by himself. As long as they were sitting down, God could not bring them up. Did you get that now? And the children of Israel couldn't just say on their own, we are going to choose this land and we are going to go there. No. So you see that their movement was a, com was a combined work, a partnership with them and God. It means, therefore, that you cannot move without God's backing and God cannot bring you into your own without your movement or participation. Did you get that? Should, that, should I say that again? You cannot move without God's backing. Or you should not move without God's backing. And God, and God cannot bring you into your own, into your prepared place without your what? Movement or participation. We are workers together with God. We dance with God. For everything God wants to do in your life, or I should say most of the things he wants to do in your life, he requires your participation. Can you, follow, can you say amen? Can you say amen? Now, he doesn't require your participation to bless you. 
Because he blessed you in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the earth. But for you to experience, say experience, say experience, for you to enjoy what has been given to you, God is not going to force it on you. So the commitment of God to the children of Israel was when they rose up, who was rising up with them? Talk to me now. Who was rising up with them? God was rising up with them. So rising or movement seems easy. But let me ask you, is it easy? If it is easy, then why, why doesn't everybody do it? I'm going to come to this soon. One of the most, I mean, a common problem with many Christians is laziness or with people generally. Do this, you won't do it. Do that, you won't do it. Mm. I'm just resting. You're always resting. I need rest. You're always needing rest. No, you don't need rest. Or let alone share, you are lazy. I didn't get a good amen on that. There is no need for amen. But rising seems easy. But it doesn't always happen. Why is it? This is the truth. It re you require strength and grace to rise. When God tells you, that's the power in God's word. When God tells you to move, what was holding you back from moving drops off you. What was impossible in another season of your life becomes easy. Are you following me, church? It becomes easy. Jesus oftentimes when he ministered to people, think about it. He saw the paralytic man. Listen, he told him, arise and walk. Arise, make on your bed and walk. If it was easy for that man to have risen up before that time, Jesus didn't need to tell him to arise and walk. Talk to me, church. But when Jesus told him, arise and walk, what happened? It means that at that point in time, there was a disbursement of grace and power to that man. In fact, if you read that story in Luke chapter 5, the Bible tells us that Jesus was teaching in, a, in the synagogue and the power of the Lord was present to heal and they brought a man born by four. And Jesus said, sons, your sins are forgiven. And then he says that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to, uh, to forgive sins. He turned to the paralytic and he said, arise. If the man could arise before that time, his friends didn't need to carry him. He would have risen in his house. But there was a pool of dunamis. Power was available at that moment. And it was on the strength of that prevailing presence of power. Jesus said, man, arise. And he rose on the strength of the word that was given. Can you say amen? The man with a withered hand in the temple, in the synagogue, Jesus met him. The people looked at Jesus, if he would heal him. And Jesus looked at him and said, stretch forth your hand. I submit to you, friends, that the power to stretch forth that hand <laughs> was given when Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. Because number one, a man whose hand is withered, cannot, he cannot stretch it by himself. And if he could stretch it, he did not need Jesus to speak the word to him and say, stretch forth your hand. So when Jesus says, stretch forth your hand, when God speaks a word, the power to do what he has said is embedded in that word. So when he said, stretch forth your hand, what the man could not do before that time, he could do it. When God says, go and conceive, it means if God says, this is your season for conception, and God is saying that to somebody today. What could not happen before in that season? We have tried it. We have toiled. We have done the test. We have done everything. We have done boost. We have done IVF. We have done it. Everything failed. It did not work. Now, a new strength is being ministered unto you. Grace is being given unto you this hour. And when the word of God says to you, go and conceive, go and have your child, that means something is administered to you at that moment. And what you could not do, what could not happen before that period will happen. It's the power of the word. It's the power of instruction. And that power is there hibernating. Some of you, there is a halo of power over your head. 
but it's not been released. You know why? Because you're not moving. The word has gone forth. You're waiting to see everything. God is saying, no, you just step forward. And what you could not do before, you will find it done. So when the word of God comes to you on anything and you move in that direction, and on the strength of that word, whether it's based on a promise or purpose, grace to accomplish it is released unto you. The same thing happened with Peter. Luke chapter 5, verse 4 to 6. Luke 5, 4 to 6. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Jesus said, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, your rema, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. Peter and his friends had toiled all night. It's night time, fishermen tell us, is the best time to catch sea, uh, catch, 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 catch fish. And they toiled, they labored, they strained themselves. They caught nothing. And so Jesus borrows Peter's boat, preaches with it. And when he finishes, in the same lake, Gennesaret, he told Peter, let down the same net to catch fish. <laughs> Peter said, <laughs> if it wasn't Jesus, and thank God that Peter had listened to Jesus' words all through that time. And I believe personally that Peter had discovered that this was not just an ordinary man. This is a powerful person. This person talking here is not just any person. And then he said, Jesus told him, let down your net. Peter said, I have toiled all night. I have done this thing before now. And this time I, I did it is actually the prescribed time for me to do it. He said, anyway, Sha, because you said it, I discern that there is something upon you. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let it down. And he did. The same sea, the same boat that was empty, the same Peter that caught nothing, the same net that he let down. In another season, he caught nothing. What was the change? The word. But you know, Peter could have still grappled with his doubts and his, his doubts could have gotten the better of him. No matter what, even though there was power administered, because anytime God speaks, there is power. There is power to do. See, eh? when God gives you his word, his word often requires you to do something impossible, to challenge the impossible. In order to do that, grace must be given unto you. Are you following me? And where do you find that grace? In the word. And Peter said, nevertheless at your word. And he let down his net, the same person, the same boat, the same net, on the same sea. But Peter could have said, where have all the sea, all, all the sea, where have all the fish gone to? But when Jesus said, let down the net, as he let it down, listen, when you respond to the word, there is a ripple effect from the word that bounces off to the situation. Jesus spoke to Peter. But when Peter acted on the word, the fish responded to that same word. There is, <laughs> oh glory, there is a chain reaction. There is a chain reaction. The same thing when Peter asked Jesus, Lord, if it is you, bid me to walk on the water. And Jesus said, come. In that singular four-lettered word was contained all the power for every force of nature to come standing still and for every supernatural law to be released. We don't know the power in God's word. He said, come. And as Peter put his first foot on the water, the wave was still there. The water was still dancing. But Peter defied the winds. He defied the waves. He defied the undulation of the water. We don't know that the water, in fact, the water was not congealed because later on he would sink. But there was a power of the endless life the power that created the heavens and the earth came into operation in that moment and it obeyed him. Jesus spoke to Peter, 
But everything that needed to come into conformity to that action of Peter responded to that word Jesus sent to Peter. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. May we not depreciate the value of the word of God. That when we have the word of God on a matter, we have power. We have power. Oh my God. <laughs> we have power. Are you kidding me? God's power released. That is why all you need to do is to find out, God, did you say it? God, did you say it? Did you say I should build a school in this season? Did you say it? Did you say I should apply for that contract in this season? Did you say it? Once you verify that it is God's word, you step out on it. It doesn't matter if dollar is racing like a crazed animal. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. What matters is what God said and your obedience, your movement upon that word. Can you say a good amen? Amen, amen. amen. So number one, moving in the right direction helps you to take possession of what is yours. Number two, what did we just say now? Behind your movement is God's commitment to bring you into your own, into your prepared place. Number three, resist oppositions to your movement. Resist oppositions to your movement. Like I just told you, if it's easy to move, everybody will move. You know, movement implies change. Change is synonymous with the living, yet it is the thing that we resist most. One of the things we resist most. So resist opposition to your movement. What are these oppositions? Number one, resist inertia. Inertia. Inertia refers to a tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged. A tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged. So as a child of God, it's important that we are constantly in a place of positive spiritual change. Notice my words. What did I say, please? Positive spiritual change. Can you say that after me? Positive spiritual change. You see, if you practice obeying God, if you practice doing the word of God, when God speaks to you, you see, it's easier for you to respond to God. If you don't practice the word of God, if you don't practice doing what the word of God says to do, that is what you read in the Bible. And the highest form of God's revelation to you is the written word. I hope you know that. It's not even the prophetic word. It's the written word. Because the prophetic word needs to be judged. Anything that comes in the form or guise of prophecy, word, whatever, must be judged with the word. Have you received a word? Probably you, you, you thought God said something to you, but when you checked it with the Bible, it didn't line up. Be honest. If you are, it may not happen to you now if you've grown in God. I'm talking about you personally. But if you if 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 you if if you if you if you if you just receive a word on this and this and this, one of the it's very dangerous for you to seek to hear the word without having an immersion in the word itself. Did you get the balance? It's dangerous to seek the word, seek a word. Lord, speak a word to me. Lord, speak a word to me. Lord, speak a word to me. But you do not immerse yourself in the word, the written word. It's dangerous. Because listen, it's not only the voice of God out there. There are other voices. And they are all contending for something. And that thing is your heart. When God speaks to, what part of you does he speak to? Your heart. You could say your spirit, but where is your spirit? Your spirit is in your heart. When other forces speak to, where do they speak to? Your heart too. So if there is no litmus test and sieve in your heart, to discern things, you may miss it. So we need to positively be changing with the word of God. Look with me at Joshua 18, verse 1 to 3. Don't put off what God has given to you. So I said resist. Did I say inertia? Inertia, yes. Uh, uh, yes, Joshua 18, 1 to 3. Now the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of meeting there, and the land was subdued before them. Verse 2. But there remained among the children of Israel, how many tribes, please? 
How many tribes, please? Seven tribes which had not yet, not yet done what? Received their inheritance. Seven tribes who had not stepped into their prepared place. Would we be right? Verse 3. Then Joshua said to the children of Israel, or to those tribes, How long will you neglect to go and possess the land which the Lord your God of your fathers has given to you? So God had told them to go. They could have gone on the strength of that word, but there was inertia. They were not going. And Joshua asked them, because of these seven tribes, how many tribes were there? Twelve. What is the half of twelve? Six. So we know that majority of them had not gone into their prepared place. Is this a statistic of the church today? It could be. It could be. But the problem was not with God. The problem was with them. And that's why, uh, 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 what's his name now? Joshua told them, how long will you neglect? That word neglect, if you read it in the CSB, it means to delay. To delay. They were waiting, perhaps they were waiting on God, but who was actually waiting on who? Who was waiting on who? God was waiting on them. But God had told them to go. If it is so easy to go, why didn't they go? Inertia. Inactivity. And that's the challenge with many Christians today. They are lazy. They are laid back. They are lackadaisical. They are not taking charge of what God has given unto them. Write this down. Constantly being inspired by the word of God is vital for the child of God to move to his prepared place. Constantly being stirred and is being stirred up by the word of God is vital for the child of God to move into his prepared place. The Bible keeps on warning us against spiritual slothfulness that you not be sluggish is that what he says? But be uh, imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit or possess the promises of God. Look with me at 2 Peter 1, 8 and 9. 2 Peter 1 verse 8. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren or unf nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Verse 8 is really what I'm interested in. Verse 9, we can skip. So notice what Peter says here. He says, for if these things are yours. What are these things? From verse uh, 5, I believe. He says, he says, for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith knowledge. So he starts from knowledge and he ends up with uh, love. Knowledge with love. There are seven things Peter tells us to add to our faith. And these seven things, he says, if these things are yours and they are abounding in you, you will neither be barren, say barren, and unfruitful, say unfruitful. That word barren can probably, may better have been translated idle. Because the word barren there is a Greek word, agos. Agos. And the word uh, unfruitful is akapos. Akapos, the negative particle on both. The word agon is the negative particle a and ergon or egos, which refers to labor, effort. And then akapos, kapos is fruit, a is unfruitful. He says you will neither be idle or unemployed in the knowledge of God. It means when the knowledge of God, that is the word of God comes to you. Listen, it gives you a job description of what you are meant to be doing. The word of God produces in your life to the degree that you engage it. To the degree that you work on it. The word works for those who work the word. The word does not work in isolation. The word is like seed. Seed will not produce until it 
is sown in fertile soil. So also the word of God will not work until it is engaged. One of the greatest areas of laziness in the body of Christ is being laid back with the word of God. It's easy to listen to music than to listen to the Bible. It's easy to come for a music program than to come from a, for a word conference. Especially a word conference in a church like, like this one. Oh yes, better believe it. Our prayer is changing it. That's why we have to engage and labor in prayer. But you come to a church like this, huh, when the pastors, they give you word, just they give you steady, they go. Not blinking. Oh, yes, it takes a lot. For you even to open your Bible and read, whether it's on your device or in the book, that's why people don't read their Bibles. And the enemy has given us a confection of sweet things to distract us. Music. Many of the music said, you know, be Bible music. Just bam, bam, jiggy, bam, bam. A lot of exciting noise. I listen to the music today and I ask, and some people are dancing and they are dancing. I say, are you hearing what they are saying? They say, yes. Ah, along by wow. Lord, may we have ears to hear this kind of music. And many of those things, a lot of, listen, even in the name of gospel music, a lot of the songs we hear today, they are not Bible. No, the words are positive. But they are humanistically positive. They are good. They make you feel good. But there is no Jesus in it. There is no revelation in it. There is no spirit of God in it. That's why it can easily appeal to an unbeliever. There are some spiritual songs that can appeal to an unbeliever. Am I in church this morning? I just took an amen to encourage myself. Are you following me in church? laziness with the word of God. You know, in those days, growing up in our own age, in my own time, I mean, I wasn't born in the dark ages, but I've been around for a little while. <laughs> I'm still very young, though, but I've been around for a little while, yes. We used to ask ourselves, what did you read in your quiet time today? Who remembers? Who belonged to that age? In fact, people don't hear quiet time anymore. Now, I'm not saying use quiet time, but <sighs> there, was, there were some things we used to do who knows what I'm talking about? Today, those things are lost. Our young people, a good number of them are being lost. I'm not saying lost in, the term, in terms of they are not saved. Spiritual things do not mean anything to them. And we parents are part of the blame. Yes, when your children turn out some ways, the responsibility is yours. Oh. Ask yourself, did you bring them to church? You took them everywhere. You took them to Dubai. You took them for vacation. You took them to swimming lesson. You took them for golf, self. I want my children to be posh. I want them to be refined. You are bush. The greatest poshness is poshness in the Bible. Any sophistication that does not result you in honoring and doing the word of God, you are, you are falling into the pressure into the pressure of your peer pressure. I just, thank you, Pastor Helen. I just assisted myself with an amen. You take them everywhere. You don't take them into the things of God. You don't monitor their spiritual growth. When they make some yeah, yeah, jacku, jacku, dirty decisions, you now begin to wonder, ask yourself, did you do what you are meant to do? Now, the decision is still theirs. Amen. Oh, yes, it's still theirs. But make that investment. But you cannot, make, you cannot stare them to make it if you are not making it yourself. If you are lazy with the word of God, you don't study the word of God. When a situation comes, you don't, we don't come together and say, what, does, what can we do? What does the Bible say on this matter? Let us as a family engage the word of God. If you want to move in your prepared place, practice is not going to happen by magic. 
Begin to practice the word in little things. When you read your word today and it tells you, it tells you, it tells you to do something, to put away lying, what do you do? Put it away. When you read the word and the word tells you, it convicts you of stinginess and it tells you to be a better giver, what do you do? Talk to me, what do you do? You respond to it. What you don't know is that these little actions here and there accumulatively, thank you Lord, propelling you into your prepared place. It's not until you hear a specific dot says the Lord, just do the word in the little things. Become devoted to the doing of the word. Can you say amen, church? So resist inertia. Say after me, I will resist. Inertia. Number two, resist discouragement and fear. These are the reasons why we don't move. Inertia, you're just lazy. Grace is giving you today to stop being lazy. I mean that. Grace is giving to you. When you hear the word of God, grace is administered to you to do what the word says. If you've been a lazy person, first of all, look at the mirror and say, you are lazy. Or linear, you are a lazy person. Look at yourself in the mirror. Then you now say, Father, I repent of laziness. Say it to him. If you are lazy, don't say it now so they don't know you are a lazy person. Mm -hmm. Lord, I repent of being lazy. I mean, you are doing a job. You have been doing that same job for 20 years. The same way. You have been making the same errors. The same way on 20 years. Grow up. It's laziness. And if you are lazy in one area of life, it will show up in another area. And I'm not talking about you being prideful about your ability. No, I'm saying if God has deposited so much in you, take advantage of it. Push yourself. You don't know the limits you can go to. There's so much you can do that you don't know. But the most friendly place you have is the bed. You like to snuggle. You like to stay in front of the TV. Me too, I like to stay in front of the TV. In fact, the way I wind down when I finish my busy day, when I come back, drop my back, change into my T-shirt and my shorts, I go in front of the TV. I go hunting. That means I look for something to watch. It helps me. But I don't spend all my time there. And I can do that because I've spent a lot of time in other productive things. It's to wind down. Yes, yes, I like to wind down. But don't be lazy with the word of God. I keep on going back to this. But grace is given to you. Can you say amen? Number two, I said resist discouragement. Look at Deuteronomy 121. It says, look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it. As the Lord your God of your fathers has spoken to you, do not, be, do not fear or be discouraged. The word fear there is a word we are familiar with, yare. I don't want to talk so much about fear because fear is something we hear a lot about. And Pastor has a classic on fear. So everything you need to hear about that is in that book, really. But the word here that I want to pick up on is the other word, which is a sister word to fear, and it works together, is the word discouraged. And that word discouraged is the Hebrew word hatat, which means, if you're writing, to be shattered, to be dismayed, to scare, to shatter or to be shattered, to be dismayed, to scare. So when somebody is discouraged, what does it mean? They're shattered. They're broken. Behind the failure of the children of Israel to go into the promised land, one of the reasons was discouragement. The children of Israel, when they got to the border of Kadesh Barnea, Moses told them, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Now when they are going into the land of King of Amor, uh, the king of uh, the Amorites, where, and he tells them to go, one of the things he's reminding them of is not to fear or to be discouraged. Listen to this. Discouragement is toxic and infectious. Discouragement is toxic and it is infectious. It is an enemy of faith that weakens your resolve to fight or take what is yours. It is an enemy of faith that, uh, what did I say? 
that weakens your resolve to fight or take what is yours. That's what discouragement is. Listen, if God told the children of Israel, I am going to push out the Amorites and all the inhabitants of the uh, promised land, and then I'm going to transport you supernaturally. One day you'll just be in the promised land. Then there'll be nothing for them to do. You and I know that doesn't happen. Okay? So, some things in life, listen, you are going to fight for. There are some things in life that are not going to just fall on you. Mm -mm. In fact, chances are that many things in life will not come easy. <laughs> I owe you the truth. What did God tell uh, the children of Israel about the land of Sihon? He said, I have given, let me read it to you because you are looking at me. I, I, I. I have given you to, into his hand, Sihon the Amorite and his land. Begin to put up verse 24. Deuteronomy 2 24. Begin to possess it and do what? Put it up. Begin to possess it and do what? Talk to me. Begin to, the last part of the verse. Begin to possess it and do what? And do what? Engage him in what? Some things in life, everything God has given to you positionally came with no effort on your part. But stepping into what he has given you, experiencing it, enjoying it, sometimes a fight will be involved. It is called the fight of but this fight is a fight the what kind of fight of faith? Fight the good fight of faith. Glory to God. Why is it a good fight? Because you win. Why is it a good fight? Because you are the declared winner. Why is it a good fight? Because God has given you the equipment to win. Amen, church. So what does discouragement do? Discouragement therefore comes in to sap your resolve, to sap your energy and determination. So many things in life are not taken without a fight. But when you are discouraged, what happens? You don't even engage the fight. Have you seen people who say, me, I don't want wala I beg, I beg, I beg. You know, some people who they call very peaceful people are not really peaceful people. I don't mean to be offensive. They are not peaceful people. It's not just that they are peaceful. They are non-confrontational. They just cannot look. They can't fight. And listen, fight is not necessarily bad. There are times God will tell you, drop the fight. God has told me on some occasion, shall I drop it? Leave it. When my legal mind that I thought I've left to rest begins to come in, and I begin to, my residual legal knowledge begins to come, but this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. In fact, you can claim this. I begin to talk like a lawyer, even though I've not been in, well, even though I've not been in court for eons. And God tells me, shall I leave it? Then there are other things I want to play cold on. The same God who tells me, leave it, will tell me, do what? Fight for it. Spirit led. How do I know whether I should fight? Or whether I should not fight. Be spirit led. But there are some people who any time fight comes. Any form of confrontation. Say I'm a very peaceful person. No you're not peaceful. You are intimidated. You are timorous. You are, you are discouraged. You just can't say no. You, can't tend, you just can't stand your ground. No receive grace today. Yes. They take your land, you say, ah, okay, take it. I beg, I beg. I hear that man is a jazz man. Who is he? Who, I say, who is he? Have you read your Bible? Have you read your Bible? You are the king's kid, man. Just hear from God. If God tells you to contend for it, I don't care who he is. I don't care who he is. He should not mess with you. If God tells you to go for it, the battle is the Lord's. He undertakes for you and he fights your battles. What are you telling me? And if you don't do it, do, don't do it because of a fear of a man. Somebody will be chancing you, slapping you, say, I'm a peaceful person. I say, Jesus came to preach peace. We are not reading the same Bible. Jesus flogged people. 
In fact, Jesus said in a place, I came to bring a sword. And how, how, how bond am I till it is consumed? In fact, I came to bring a fire to this world. The, on, better know what you mean by saying Jesus is a person of peace. Read your Bible well. Amen, church. There are some things in life you need to stand your ground. There are some things the enemy wants to take from you. And you say, no, in the name of Jesus, this is mine. You put up a fight for it. Fight for your health. Fight for your children. Fight for your prosperity. Anything God has given and the enemy wants to put his filthy, dirty, slimy, stinking hands on, you kick him out. Fight for it. And don't say, oh, I'm a peaceful. You are not a, no, 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 no. You are not a gentleman like that. Can you say amen? So am I saying resist discouragement? All right, my time is up. I don't even know anywhere I'm going now. So, <laughs> write this one. I'll end with this. I'll end with this. Resist. Discouragement takes different forms. Number one, write this, this, write this down. It may take the form of disappointment. And number two, it may take the form of disinformation. Lift your hands and thank God for his word. If I have time, I'll develop this in the second service. If not, let's lift our hands. Let's thank God for his word this morning. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Movement, motion in the right direction. Being led by the spirit of God. Thank you, Father. Oh, blessed be your name. We are moving in the right direction. We're taking possession of what is ours. Thank you, Lord. As we take a step in the direction Behind our movement is your commitment to take us to our prepared place. And we'll resist oppositions to our movements. Resist inertia. Resist discouragement. Whether in the form of disappointment or whether in the form of disinformation. Thank you, Father. We give you praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. Grace is being administered to us even this morning in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. For us to do things we have not been able to do in other times and other seasons. As we hear your voice and we move on your spoken word. Thank you for that because the strength of that word is released to us. We give you praise and glory this morning. In Jesus name. Amen and amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head is bowed. All eyes are closed. No one looking around this moment. You're in church today, you're not born again. You don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life. The first step you need to take into moving into anything God has for you is a relationship with God. If that is you, can I see your hand up? You'd like to be born again. All heads are bowed. Every eye is closed. You want to accept Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Can I see your hand up? Can I see your hand up? Can I see your hand up? If you're watching online, put one hand on your chest. Leave the other, lift the other to heaven as a sign of surrender to Jesus. And say after me, Father God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for me. And you raised him from the dead for my salvation. Jesus, save me now. I make you my Savior and my Lord. Thank you, Father, for saving me. In Jesus' name. I'll pray for you. Father, I pray for as many persons that pray this prayer. I declare over them that now they are new creations in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And from this day forward, Father, they'll walk in the newness of life. Thank you for a new beginning for them. They'll not only prosper, they will equally flourish. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, my brother and sister, welcome to the family of God. Please follow the prompt on your screen. Reach out to us and we'll be glad to reach out to you and serve you. Amen. Amen, church, and amen.